Rajpur and Abdidi. So, let's start the session. I think we're doing Chitra starting the session. I would uh, request, uh, you know, everybody right from Kashish. Uh, we start from Kashish from that side, you know, to introduce, uh, you know, yourself. Then uh, with Pallavi and so on, everybody. So, make, we take just a minute to introduce ourselves. So, hi everyone. My name is Kashish Madan and I handle uh, the performance marketing and the entire growth part for Grid Global nationally and internationally as well. We are just expanding towards the MENA and the SCA market. So, this is like if I talk about my overall experience, I have an experience of 10 plus years in online gaming and I have worked for brands like Adda 52 and 9 Stacks Poker in the past along with international gaming. So it was a, it's a pleasure to be in here today. And thank you so much for having me here. Hi everyone, good afternoon. I'm Pallavi Barman. Um, I am the, I'm running strategy for HRX now. Started my career eight years ago with HRX. Uh, working on a celebrity brand was a very unique sort of a concept back then and continues to uh, be even today because it has its own challenges and um, own learning curve. But uh, the reason why I guess I'm on this panel is uh, because A, I have a brand which is built on the super influencer of this country. So I guess I qualify. Second, I'm also a digital only brand or have been a digital only brand for the first seven years, eight years of its existence. So I guess these two things make a cut for me. Personally, if I have to talk about myself, I'm a big fitness enthusiast myself. I run half marathons and uh, I practice calisthenics. I love cooking, I love reading, I'm an avid traveler. Um, Love everything that's expensive and lovely in this lifetime. Thank you so much. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. This is Sunil Nath. Uh, mm -hmm. Just one minute, I know. So, uh, I had e-commerce and digital at Galdama for India and Asian countries. That's all. Hi, everyone. I'm Jahan. I had the creative content and channels for Pfizer. Before this, I was, uh, I have like 14 years in advertising agencies and uh, this is my like first stint from the client side, so bringing best of the both worlds. Hi everyone, my name is Geet Rathi. I lead marketing and brand for Mosaic Wellness. Mosaic Wellness essentially has three health and wellness digital platforms uh, for men, women and kids. Man Matters, Be Body Wise and Little Joyce. So again, we also uh, use influencers to a large extent, so looking forward to the discussion today. Perfect. Um, great to meet all of you. Uh, my name is uh, Amit Patel. I am currently the Director and Senior Head of Marketing at CIPLA. Uh, specifically into consumer marketing business. We run the largest campaigns in prescription marketing space. Uh, prior to this, I was uh, at Dabur heading the digital marketing and e-commerce for international business in almost 70 countries. I have experience in e-commerce. I have experience uh, in service industry right now in pharma and uh, down the line. Let's see where the journey goes. Thank you so much. Yeah, so I'll just quickly introduce myself. Uh, I'm Vineet Bhakshandani. Uh, I'm creative head, uh, chief creative officer at V Rock Communications Network, and uh, we uh, take care of uh, the uh, healthcare advertising across uh, uh, all the companies. We are Cipla, you know, with uh, Pfizer, and uh, you know, quite a few other ones, Dr. Reddy's, and other places. So we've been basically do the uh, right from the creative strategies to the. Uh, uh, you know, creative outputs with the productions and the TVCs and everything is, is that comes under my role. So I think we'll begin the today's discussion on uh, uh, the influencers. The first question I think Kashish would like, like to ask you is what tools or platforms can help uh, streamline the process of discovering and vetting authentic influencers? Uh, see. If we talk about like if we are living in the AI uh, we, you know, stage where now we have a lot of tools available in the market which can help you to refine also the influencers like uh, what kind of following that they are having, is it genuine or not, right? So there is a lot of things are there but still uh, the best uh, practice uh, or what people still follow right now is to do a manual search from their end. So when I say manual, you know, like if, if for example, if I am if, uh, for a particular affinity or if a particular category I'm looking for, brands from their end now, like, you know, they do a research, right? And then they, of course, they tell us, like, you know, this is what, like, we are looking for. They have their own criteria, like, you know, they refine everything from their end because they have their tools available with them. But uh, if I talk about... Uh, 
the brands that I have worked with, most of them, they want us to do the manual search, right? Look for the influencers, uh, how authentic they are. Uh, like, uh, you know, uh, we also have the tools available with us, so we can also check it from our end, that what kind of content they are posting. Is it very relevant to the uh, brand ethos? Like, if it's for the healthcare, then the person should match that criteria. And this is what, like, uh, you know, uh, how, uh, uh, things are right now but apart from that uh, when we do all these manual checks you know uh, what kind of posts that they are what kind of content that they are creating how authentic it is and uh, what kind of comments people are putting it in there right you know like like we see a lot of time for engagement people you know uh, they put uh, like you know they have their own whatsapp group and, you know they just put the comments there that you know just share like and comment so that they can get more engagement so this is like you know uh, it was like a story like three four years ago but right now uh, being uh, like you know being i have worked for the brand i have also like done a lot of like uh, you know influencer activities in the past so you can easily you know gauge that if the can uh, the content creator is posting the stuff which I really want them to post or not and what kind of comments that they are putting in. Everything can easily be managed and it can easily be like, you know, uh, checked uh, by, uh, you know, checking their comment section and how many uh, posts that they have reshared. So we have all the data available. So that can actually, you know, help uh, the brands as well as us to like, you know, that how we can uh, uh, check that uh, is that particular influencer or a, or a content creator is authentic or not. So manual research is something which like, you know, people still believe in doesn't matter how many AI tools come into the picture. But of course, after three to four years, it will be all like, you know, uh, based on the research as per the AI because it gives you the demographics uh, in um, uh, demographic advantage as well. And uh, of course, there are other factors as well, but uh, AI will be uh, a pay will play a key role in the next two, three years. My second, my second question would be, uh, you know, for Sunil. Uh, Sunil, uh, uh, what are the prime factors to keep in mind while evaluating an influencer? You know, authenticity, alignment. You know, with the brand values. You know, especially, so especially when you, you know, come in from, uh, you know, coming in from you because you handle one of the leading brands. Uh, you know, uh, you know, in the from Galdama. So, you know, in the Dama section. So, we'd like to, you know, hear this from you. So, I think. Uh, <coughs> There are a couple of parameters and the brand we run today is not only the influencer brand. So we have a different type of influencer. The first influencer is dermatologist because they are writing our products. And then second is your obviously your skin influencer, beauty influencer. But today if you ask us, uh, the journey is quite old for us. So uh, we use all of them while engaging with our audiences. And uh, when you're looking at the factor, I'll say the first thing is the brand authors. When we're looking at influencer, where, where they really fit into brand authors because Cetaphil is a global brand, 75 years, so we definitely look into whether they qualify for that. Second parameter, what is their performance? So, uh, uh, we are working with our retainer agency from roughly three and a half years today, and over the time with them, we have developed a tool. So, this tool will, so you shortlist the creator into the tool, the tool will uh, automatically pick their top 50 posts and uh, last 50 posts and give you all your criteria. What is your engagement rate? What is their engagement views? And then based on a lot of other parameters, that will qualify a score to each creator. So any score more than 70, we pick it that this fits into our criteria and that's a customized by them for us. So all those, so your brand ethos, obviously one. Second is how they are performing. Third is how authentic they are. Because in pharmaceuticals, we cannot claim anything which is not true. So for to claim any data, if he's saying that we are a number one brand, we need to have 10 data points behind it to verify that that's true. So with we, when we saying that we want to say this, so we want them to also believe that this comes with a lot of data. And I'll give you one example. We were doing a shoot with Karina for a Cetaphil baby. And we, we told them that we are the uh, PDA prescribed brand. And they said that I don't believe this. Then we said that we are number one skincare brand in dermatology. She said that I don't believe you give me the reports. So we actually got the reports, which is from IQVR, a lot of people here know, to give her that this is how the data proves. Then we said that uh, some of our products are not having sulfate and parabens. So she said, I don't believe you give us a report. So, so even today, uh, every quarter we do one event offline where we call influencers and dermatologists together. We always talk about that what is authenticity required from uh, influencers in today's time. And that's where we, we, we try to um, educate them 
towards authenticity, but when we shortlist them, brand, authenticity, their uh, co content type, and whether this resonates to oral style of ours. These are the parameters. So, uh, now coming on to the uh, trust through transparency, like for example, uh, uh, Pali would, Pallavi, would you like to answer this one? You know, how can uh, a transparency in influencer brand relationships impact the consumer's trust and loyalty? Sure. Um, so like earlier on, I was mentioning how we are a fitness brand, India's first homegrown fitness brand, which is built on a fitness icon called Hrithik Roshan. Um, to my mind, there are two parts to the coin. One is the brand aspect of things and one is the business aspect of things. It's a mantra in a way, I would say, now that I've been in the journey for eight years, the only way a celebrity brand, uh, celebrity slash artist slash influencer driven brand survives the times is when your brand is authentic and organic. Which means, if I have to elucidate this, for example, Rithik looks a certain way, Rithik works hard, irrespective, Rithik, Rithik trains, he is a fitness icon. So whether I remove the brand from his life or continue the brand, uh, continue to grow the brand around him, there would be a mutual rub off where both of them will uh, benefit. But in isolation, both of them can coexist. If I remove the brand from Rithik, he would still be Rithik the personality and hence authenticity and organic uh, sort of storytelling comes to the fore when it comes to brand building. The part of the business where you need to be both practical and transparent, I feel, uh, because if you are a brand for the masses, you cannot peg yourself a notch above Nike, a notch above New Balance and say, hey, this quality, that quality, only because the celebrity is talking on, in, on your behalf, in your favor, you can't suddenly start commanding a premium, you have to play it right on the price attributes, on the other strategies and so on and so forth. So I feel both sides of the coins have to be balanced. One is the brand building aspect, which needs to be extremely authentic and organic so that every day is not an effort for the celebrity. It's a part, it's ingrained, it's, it's a part of the system. And also the business needs to run in a very, very practical and transparent way so that the customers are aware that you're offering a quality which is at par with Nike, but you're selling at a cheaper price point because you don't have retail stores. And that is something that I have spoken in each of my interviews, saying the reason why I'm able to pass on the benefits to the consumers is because I don't have overheads, and hence I'm a cheaper brand, but I'm not compromising on quality, and yet I'm not for the athletes. So st uh, staying true to the spirit, saying you're meant for everyday athlete, you're not um, you know, talking the same language across the board through micro-influencers, working on user-generated content, featuring all of them in our campaigns alongside Rithik, so if you see our campaigns in the past few years, a lot of real people have featured. They're all a part of the influencer community because the way we kind of work on our campaigns is we uh, get them to become an extended part of the HRX family. They grow as the brand grows, they grow as the business grows, their followers, um, you know, we kind of aid them in acquiring followers by reposting the content through the celebrity or through the brand page, by featuring them in the campaigns. So the end goal is not just improving their metrics or KPIs, the end goal is also becoming a certain somebody, a voice or a key opinion leader in the world of fitness. So we actually tend to work on each of our uh, family, quasi-family members as an opinion leader or a thought leader in the industry. Now that strategy has really worked uh, when it comes to instilling trust in the people. The campaigns are absolutely authentic and kind of created by people themselves at times. The one during COVID actually won us a YouTube award. For the, for the maximum number of organic views, without any promotions, without any kind of marketing. That's because the real people featured in that campaign. It was actually a user-generated content-led campaign. So I guess these are the three things, four or five things that we have kind of maintained throughout which have made us a trustworthy and uh, opinion-leading brand in the fitness industry. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Pallavi. Thanks for uh, your, uh, you know, uh, detailed, you know, description on the entire scenario. Jahan, what, what would, uh, you know, you know Nail, my next question would be with you saying that, you know, what are the some alternative, uh, you know, metrics or methods for measuring the success of this influencer campaign, you know, beyond the, you know, engagement, you know, and the follower growth. So what would so be that? I would say there are several metrics which uh, one can think of uh, depending on the nature of the campaign. So, like, I'll give, I'll start with some examples, like, for us in the pharma sector, like, mm -hmm. Uh, if we are doing something with the influencer, it's not just the engagement which is happening with the influencer, mm -hmm. but we would also see that what kind of conversations are picking up from there with the influencers. So the okay. followerships are great, 
mm. if the person is, I mean, people are engaging with the post or whatever the influencer is throwing at, mm. uh, that's absolutely fine. But at the end of the day, if something is picking up in the clinic, uh, mm -hmm. between doctors and the patients, mm -hmm. uh, the conversations about the disease, about the therapy or what needs to be done, if that's getting picked up, that's also a success for us. Uh, at the end, of course, the uh, share of voice, the brand, uh, you know, the kind of traffic which is uh, growing on the brand page mm -hmm. or the traffic which is, you know, uh, coming to the brand uh, through different, you know, touch points, it's something which is defining the success of the influencer metric. And how would you, uh, you know, incorporate the qualitative research methods into this influencer campaign to do that? So, we usually, of course, we do the market research, uh, which uh -huh. is pre-campaign and post-campaign. Uh -huh. uh, also, we measure it with the tools which are nowadays readily available. So, the AI tools help us to monitor what kind of, what is the campaign doing. So, right from the influencer impact to the kind of promotions or whatever things are going on we at least get to know that if that is really working for us or not. And other thing for us is not just that the mass audience, for the mass audience, the, definitely the celebrity or whosoever, the personality is an influencer. But at the end of the day, in the household, even a mother is an influencer. So, you know, mother is someone who is looked upon, right? So, I mean, I can say that you see ads, Dettol or any other brands, like they always target the mothers because they are the we know the face who is going to take care of the family from the health point of view, hygiene point of view. So, you know, the mother is the first influencer which starts from home. Definitely the doctors like uh, Sunil mentioned, they too are the influencers because majority of the conviction which uh, the doctors can build, it's something which uh, none of the advertising channels can do because at the end of the day, certain brands, certain products in pharma, uh, the doctors are the, you know, advocators, they are the one who would at least push for that this is the best thing for you or your child or whatever the thing is. So, I think influencer parameter are at different levels and the metrics can be defined in these manner, the nature of the campaign. And uh, this, the question which I'll just throw open for you guys, I mean, what role, you know, can AI or a machine learning play in, you know, measuring the effectiveness of the influencer campaigns, basically, efforts? So, if you could, would you like to answer? Yeah. I mean, I'll just take it up because I have a very contrarian view when it comes to creating an influencer campaign. Um, it always starts or stems from a strategy. Strategy is difficult to feed into a system. However, you can use machine learning mm -hmm. to create designs or what I mean is to design your campaign, a machine learning uh, tool can come in handy, which essentially takes you to the mouth of the funnel. It gives you the short list. You crawl around and you identify, okay, this is my set, what's talking. But when it comes to identifying, drilling down, working hand in glove, I genuinely feel that a human interface is priceless, is irreplaceable no matter how advanced AI gets because what you generate out of it is what actually feeds into the brand in the most sort of uh, relatable way. So, so I, I think I'll add on into this and because we're working with a lot of technology today, and developing a lot of tools parallelly when we work on this entire piece. Yes, uh, like uh, like Jasmine mentioned that yes, it requires the human touch, but I think when it's come to the entire measurement, like you're saying, the impact piece, I think that's it's gonna play a role. And then ultimately over the time, what will happen, you know that what is working for you, what is not working for you, which even today, a lot of time, human have to spend a lot of time to analyze whether this campaign really worked right. Completely. So uh, after maybe one campaign, two campaign, three campaigns, you will have this, your top 100 creators where you just go them and give them a campaign and they start performing for you. So that analysis will be definitely taken care. And I think <coughs> AI is now everywhere embedded. So it starts throwing data and data start making sense for all of us. Sure. In fact, I just want to like to add uh, something, very valid points of course, but uh, there is also a growing trend uh, and specifically in Far East countries like China, Japan, uh, when I was there, uh, it is called as virtual influencers, right? And this virtual influencers is something that is going to be the biggest benefits uh, which we take from the AI uh, bandwagon that is going on right now. I personally think that AI is just a tool, uh, what we feed into that actually what strategy that we make in the boardrooms and you use that tool to do work faster, to get things move faster. That is the best use case of AI and I believe uh, when we were discussing a campaign targeted towards kids, right? the campaign is called Tuffies, we talked to kids who are uh, from first standard to fifth standard. Uh, 
and we wanted to build affinity with them. Now they are not going to understand a brand. They are not going to understand if I'm going to talk to them about say inhaler usage or a device technique. But they are very, they will have a very strong affinity to a cartoon character, right? They might not understand the nuances that why is mamma giving me this inhaler? But if I see that uh, my friend is reading a comic book with these lovely characters into it in a fictional place and you give a moral out of that, I think that is something they will follow. And this can be easily created with AI these days, whereas earlier we used to draw everything by hand, it saves a lot of time and energy and money, right? So I think these are the pockets where AI can make a very strong impact, specifically in this emerging trend of uh, virtual influencers. Thank you. Thanks, Amit. Uh, my next question will be for Geet. Uh, Geet, um, what are the benefits and challenges of, uh, you know, exclusive partnerships between the brands and the influencers? So if you could throw some… Yeah, I think uh, I feel there are very two distinct features about health and wellness marketing specifically, which is different from a regular marketing. One, it's obviously outcome based and it takes time. And two, I think the burden of proof on outcomes is quite high on marketing. But the tricky part is that it's very easy to make claims, right? And ours is a trust deficient country, and especially the kind of TG that we are reaching out to by influencers are very evolved audiences, right? So I think the one obvious benefit is that if you stick to a particular influencer that is vouching for your particular platform or for your service or product, I think it builds a lot of trust versus the influencer every other day coming and promoting some other product. So I think that reach that you get from the influencer, you also start building trust with that. So that's, I think, the obvious benefit. I think the other non-obvious benefit that I realized is like as brand custodians, I think in the initial days I used to get very happy when I find an influencer who is excited and has a lot of conviction and sees the brand and the proposition like you see. But the tricky part or the other side to that is that these people also come back and say, yeah, let's tweak this, you know, ye change kar lete. and it's very hard as brand custodians, that's very scary for us. Like, no, no, this is what we want you to say, right? So, finding an influencer that understands and aligns with your brand values and is also aligned to how you want to say it, I think it's, it's a godsend gift if you find someone great and then stick with that person versus finding different people and going through that cycle again, which I felt was a very practical thing that we noticed over time, which gave us a lot of benefit, which I realized over doing it a couple of times, right? So I think that's the second non-obvious benefit. Now the challenges of course is uh, justifying the ROI because uh, obviously for exclusive partnership when you category block particular influencers then they also charge you higher. So figuring out whether this influencer will work for you or not work for you and then justifying a lower ROI for that to which you potentially don't know how it might turn out to be is obviously a tricky part. Uh, so that's the challenge that I feel is there and second is obviously in today's day and age uh, influencers also get cancelled a lot, right? Like they have their own personal opinions, they talk about a lot of other different things and if an influencer gets cancelled, it's upon the brand to realize or take a call whether you want to stick with that influencer or not uh, through thick and thin, right? So I think that's a tricky challenge that, that we've also seen in the past uh, and then you need to take a call whether you want to stick with that influencer or not. So, so do you think so that long-term uh, relationship with the influencer does it exist, or does it, uh, or is it like uh, you know, uh, the you know, in like in the brands like HRX, the brands are like completely. There's a different scenario, but I'm especially when it can when it comes to the other brands. I mean, what do you mean? When, when, where, where do you see the sustainability or the long-term relationship happening with the brand? Do you want to add something, Pallavi, first? No, I just wanted to say to what you're saying, Geet, thanks to hmm. the advent of the long-term relationships with influencers, there are hmm. alternate retail structures which are also kind of emanating, which is of great advantage to businesses and uh, brand managers and marketing managers. Now, most of these influencers are ready to collaborate on revenue share as well, which, so which was something which was unheard of. Hmm. So if you don't want to top load your campaigns and if you, if you want to sort of give it some time, and I feel that's a wiser thing to do because any campaign needs that kind of incubation, warm up, where people start catching on, start relating, uh, you know, the, the, the relationship between the celebrity and the brand. It's a good enough time, a six months to a one year where the influencer is willing to work with you exclusively on a revenue share model is a great win-win for both parties, I feel. I think I'll, I think I'll add to this in particular to our health as, as an industry. I think I'm trying this from last two years if you really ask me. And uh, every time when we select somebody, we say you do five posts for us, 
-hmm. two will perform, three will not perform. And then you automatically lose the confidence of the creator. And so it's a, it's, it's a two dynamic environment today that even the content creator are facing where their content is sometime performing, sometime not performing. And this put you in situation, do you really want to put so much of money by blocking these top 10 or top 20 creators? Mm -hmm. So bits and pieces you can try, but I think largely when, when I'm speaking to a lot of people like us, it's not happening, even today. But to answer your question, I do think I'm a strong believer in that. Uh, like Lisa Mangaldas is one influencer that we used to work with at very early days and we collabed with her a couple of times and uh, we had an exclusive partnership with her and I, I think both of us benefited a lot because the other thing is that influencers also have a very strong and good pulse of their followers and if their followers are your consumers, I think the other benefit is that you also get a lot of insights from them sometimes which maybe a lot of times are blind spots for us because we are too close to the brand or too close to the proposition. So I, I've definitely seen a lot of benefit coming in by having exclusive partnerships because A, the conviction is very high in the influencer as well. And I think it's all about conviction, right? Because consumers or users can see that whether this is just a promotion or is the influencer really believing in the product and the service or not. So, 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 so you're saying that, uh, you know, that, I mean, the, the, basically the creative uh, freedom in the, you know, basically the spon uh, sponsored content, you know, you know, matters a lot uh, and, you know, or, or does it, you know, hinder, you know, how, how does it work basically? It's a, it's a very touchy, touchy topic because that's usually the discussion that we end up having with influencers where there's a fight and like in ER, I think, I know my followers want this, I think this is how we should say it and then we come in and say, oh, no, no, this is how we know you want it. So. Yeah. It's a very thin line. I think it's it's it's. I think that's what makes it interesting. That how do you find the balance? And therefore, if you're able to find somebody who gets exactly what you want to say and is also aligned to it, then I think you should just go all in on that person. I would just add to that: having more of a raw or organic kind of a creative works the best because today your audience has become very smart. It's not like the audience in the 90s that you know any damn actor can come and just say anything. It's now it's like they see what the kind of, you know, personality the influencer has, whether that matches with the brand. It's is it he living by that particular thing which he's endorsing. So all those things matters and I feel that the creative again, if it's more organic or raw in nature, works the best. So my next question, uh, my next question uh, would be for Amit. Amit, what are the key elements of uh, a successful co-creation strategy and how can, you know, brands ens ensure the influencer creative freedom? Yep. Thank you uh, for this question. I think uh, this uh, is what we discussed at Backstage just, as well. Yeah, so I mean, I just <laughs> wanted like, you know, I think you… <laughs> yeah, go ahead, go ahead. <laughs> that eventually a long-term tie-up with an influencer leads to co-creation and in most cases it does. And I believe uh, co-creation, it, it, it really, really works when uh, you see your influencer as a partner in your journey. If it is just a tick mark, then it won't work. I think the greatest example of co-creation the world has seen, according to me, will be Air Jordans, where Nike par partnered with uh, Michael Jordan. And it created history. It resulted in billions and billions of dollars, right? I think what we are seeing right now, if I take examples of other type of co-creation, which might not lead to direct sales, but uh, let's take example of Red Bull. The way Red Bull chooses its influencers in that particular space, high adrenaline sports, is crazy. Let's take example of another brand in the same genre, let's say like GoPro. GoPro also has a very specific set and choices. They try to read out what the people in that space are doing and they try to go and uh, have a tie-up with them. So it is not just about tying up for the sake of it. Uh, I'll tell you one more example and this will be from the pharmaceutical industry, specifically in prescription space. So one of the campaigns that we run, it's called Beirug Zindagi, which is about changing the perception of India towards asthma and inhalation therapy. Right? Now we want more and more people to come out and say to the world that yes, they are an asthmatic. And yes, nothing is holding them back. They live a Beirug Zindagi. But because of societal stigma and myths, they refrain from doing that. We have a list of sports personalities who we know for a fact that they are asthmatic. But as soon as we approach them, despite people, you know, who has decent level of education, they still shy away from doing this, right? And that's where we kind of internally had a strategy change. So we try to put it in this way. I think uh, co-creation also works in this way where uh, you try to see the pain 
if your brand or uh, your solution is not there in the life of that influencer and can you bring out that pain the second way of seeing that would be if my brand or uh, my campaign is associated with a particular influencer can, will it be pleasurable to that influencer so it's either that pain or pleasure areas that you have to identify that leads to a successful co-creation i would say otherwise it will be a tick mark and this is a very very good trend that uh, i have personally observed specifically in middle east where influencers have now become entrepreneurs uh, by launching their own makeup brands it is a trend that we are seeing in skin care it is a trend that we are seeing aggressively in hair care companies like dabar are doing co-creation with some middle eastern celebrities and all and this is only going to grow because of this community uh, which is very aggressive and has a large influence i am sure that down the line even in pharma to some extent this can happen specifically in creating awareness campaigns high volatile awareness campaigns that we do i see this as a trend with long term relationships so that's my take on co creation yeah uh thanks if anyone would like to add anyone. so i think a, a very valid point and i think uh, this is our uh, the current strategy which we have built for the cfo setup hill so uh, globally so no tv ads uh, no digital ads it's only advocacy based marketing this is what uh, we will looking at as a strategy and i think in india we already doing this very well and i think i uh, some of the some of the people in this room already know that in april setup hill was trending on twitter although the brand is not on twitter and the first question was that why setup hill is to a trending on twitter and then the conversation is happening and then we also realize the conversation happening it's happening positive so we then just fueled it with more memes and people are keep sharing memes but why this trend has happened because in last two years there's a lot of influencers collaboration has happened which actually trigger a lot of uh, organic uh, interactions about the brand and i'll give you an example uh, there is a creator his name is rohit sachdeva and he runs a beauty shop in delhi so he started with making videos so he created a video about satafel four products and it's a hindi video uh, and then he started that video he had roughly 600k followers so video started trending his followers started trending by the time video reached 25 million he had 1.5 million followers so as the brand grow a lot of content creators realize that and today when we see we create we, let's say in a quarter we doing 100 collaboration we see organically 200 people are also talking about the brand and then we we reaching out to them and we saying okay let's do a paid collaboration the content doesn't work but when they doing organically it's work so i think whatever we as trying to influence i think there are influencer who also pick the conversation and start building brands organically like we saying so those organic conversations makes the entire scenario better for any brand in fact just to add uh, there uh, so apart from influencers there are also certain channels who act as influencers if i say tvf was the biggest influencer during my college days when it got started with the content that they were doing at that point of time versus look at the influence that they are having now with the shows that they are doing right similarly filter copy as a channel a lot, lot of these channels have the power so brands are more and more associating towards this channel and creating the content you know short lived 5 minutes video where it's a heartwarming story and your product is uh, you know interwoven in that story itself instead of it becoming an ad it becomes a content piece so a lot of these channels and this kind of strategies are also emerging out um I, i'll just add um i think co-creation is catching on in the field of marketing uh, very very actively because if you just kind of backtrack and look at the influencers um modus of working typically it is um creator creating content content creating community and community generating commerce eventually which is what is the dream that all of us live today right when you tie in when you identify that right influencer whose community aligns with your own community or rather brings in a new cohort that is wishful for you i think there is no better way than to kind of co-create with them because then you are allowing their audience to discover you and your audience to discover them as the opinion leaders which works really well in in the favor of brands and businesses today so i think it's a it's a very cost effective and a great uh, strategy to be deployed in today's day and age where content is the king and everybody's consuming content and especially where you have captive communities under these people so like i mean look at kim look at kylie look at the west has been doing this forever there are tons of examples huda beauty has is not too old which is the eastern concept but west ashton kutcher halle berry uh kim kardashian i mean the kardashians everybody kind of did this even today the gen z has launched already 
whether you talk about uh, Stranger Things actors in their 20s or everybody's doing this very, very rapidly because they're realizing the power of the captive community and how those community uh, members can quickly trans translate into commerce for them. So, I, will, in the, I would like to thank uh, Kashish, uh, Pallavi, Sunil, Jahan, Geet and Amit. Thank you for taking time. Thank you.